this video exercise, we will demonstrate how to use the Receptor Grid Generation panel to set up and start a grid file calculation job. Grid files represent physical properties of a volume of the receptor, specifically the active site, that are searched when attempting to dock a ligand. Grid generation can be thought of as the first stage in setting up a ligand docking job, as the ligand docking cannot be performed until the receptor grids have been generated. Because receptor grid generation requires a prepared structure, i.e. an all-atom structure with appropriate bond orders and formal charges, we recommend first viewing the related videos on protein structure preparation using the protein preparation wizard. The receptor and ligand complex used in this exercise can be found within the bundle tutorial files. So to access them within Maestro, let's go to help, tutorials, then select the glide quick start guide tutorial and choose copy. This will copy the structure files necessary for this exercise into the directory shown here, which in this case is the working directory. Now let's import the complex, which in this case is actually two files, one containing the receptor and one containing the ligand. We'll go to project, import structures. Then we'll select one fjs underscore prep underscore lig dot mae dot gz and one fjs underscore prep underscore recep dot mae dot gz and then click open. Next, we'll command or control click the other entry so that both ligand and receptor are shown on screen. Then left click back in the workspace and press L on the keyboard, which is the keyboard shortcut to zoom in on the ligand. Now you'll notice that only the backbone atoms are shown, so let's apply a workspace style by pressing command or control Y, which is equivalent to pressing the apply style button. Let's also show hydrogen bonds using the H-bond and contacts button also from the style toolbar. Now that we have our receptor ligand complex on screen, we can launch the receptor grid generation panel. Go to tasks, docking, grid generation. Or if you're in the applications mode, go to applications, glide, receptor grid generation. Or search for it in the task tree. The first tab in the receptor grid generation panel covers defining the receptor. The define receptor section contains options for defining part of the system in the workspace to be treated as the receptor. So if only the receptor is included in the workspace, then you can ignore this option. However, since we have a receptor ligand complex, we'll need to pick the ligand, like so. Now the selected ligand will be excluded from the receptor grid generation calculation, and this ligand will not be present during the ligand docking stage later on. Everything not defined as the ligand will be treated as part of the receptor, and this may include any ions, waters, or cofactors. Now, if you happen to be using a binding site from a sitemap calculation, which for example, you may have run to identify allosteric binding sites, then simply switch the selection from molecule to entry, and then pick any of the sitemap points. The next section of the receptor tab covers van der Waals radius scaling. Because Glide does not allow for receptor flexibility in docking, apart from the optional hydroxyl and thiol rotations, scaling of van der Waals radii of nonpolar atoms can be applied to decrease penalties for close contacts and model a slight give in the receptor and the ligand. Now, if you have a receptor in which there is a substantial movement upon docking, such as from sidechain conformation, backbone location, or loop conformations, you should consider docking to multiple protein conformations, which means setting up multiple grids, or to use the induced fit protocol to account for protein flexibility. With that said, Glide has two means for accounting for protein flexibility by scaling of van der Waals radii. For nonpolar receptor atoms, you can adjust the scaling factor value shown here. By default, it is set to the recommended value of 1 for ordinary glide docking where no scaling is performed. However, if you are working with a particularly tight binding site, you could try reducing the scaling factors to allow non-native ligands to dock and score better. Though keep in mind that changing the scaling factors changes the final docking scores, so results from runs with different scalings cannot be compared directly. And as a general rule, it is a good idea to test adjusted scalings on a set of known actives in order to determine the optimal settings before attempting a full virtual screening run. Now note that there is also a partial charge cutoff for scaling the van der Waals radii. This is to ensure that only non-polar atoms are scaled, as scaling the radii of polar atoms has a deteriorating effect on the calculation of accurate ligand receptor hydrogen bonds.
Now, if you prefer greater control over softening the receptor potential, you could go a step further and specify van der Waals radii and charge scaling on a per atom basis. Here, you can read in the radius and charge scaling factors from an input maestro file, such as from an example where you have previously set per atom scaling factors. Or, if this is your first attempt, then by specifying the scaling factors for selected atoms. Simply choose the selection mode and then pick the atoms in the workspace. Then they will appear as rows in the table. Here you can double click to edit the scaling factors. Now in this example however, we won't apply any scaling factors. Now in addition to normal hydrogen bonds that are included in grid generation, we have here the option to account for other non-covalent interactions that are generally weaker but could be important. Namely, hydrogen bonds to aromatic hydrogens, Hydrogen bonds to halogens, where halogens are treated as acceptors, or halogen bonds, where halogens are treated as donors. Although technically they're not hydrogen bonds, we include them here as a class of weak non-covalent interactions. In the final section of the receptor tab of grid generation is the option to use the partial charges from the input structure rather than from the force field. This option is useful if, for example, you have obtained improved partial charges around the active site, such as those from a Q-site calculation or from a QM polarized ligand docking calculation. Now that the ligand has been excluded, we can proceed to the next step, which is to define the active site volume for which grids will be calculated. These settings here under the site tab determine where the scoring grids are positioned and how they are prepared for the structure in the workspace. As you can see here, the purple enclosing box, which represents the volume of the protein for which grids will be calculated, is automatically defined by the centroid of the ligand we selected back in the receptor tab. It also assumes we'll be docking ligands with a similar size to this workspace ligand. Now this setup is ideal when you have a representative ligand already in the active site, as it automatically adjusts the size of the enclosing box to the dimensions of a known ligand binder. If, however, you think that conformations of active ligands may exist that are significantly larger than the co-crystallized ligand, you should consider enlarging the enclosing box with this option. Generally, it is best to make the enclosing box as small as is consistent with the shape and character of the protein's active site and with the ligands you expect to dock. The advanced settings show additional controls of an inner green box or ligand center box. This defines the acceptable positions for the ligand center during the site point search and gives a truer measure of the effective size of the search space. Here we have the advanced controls to adjust the size of the box in X, Y or Z space. This can be useful to allow ligands to find unusual or asymmetric binding modes in the active site or to confine their midpoints to a smaller box, eliminating some of the less useful poses and saving calculation time. Note that the purple enclosing box also adjusts with the green ligand center box. This is because the enclosing box needs to be big enough to contain all ligand atoms when the ligand center is placed at the edge or vertex of the inner ligand center box. Now keep in mind that very large grid boxes might not be useful as they can take up more disk space and memory usage for scoring grids, which takes longer to compute. If you're using an active site from a sitemap calculation, in which case the sitemap points may have been used to define the binding site, then you will need to reduce the size of the enclosing grid box, as it was likely defined by the large spread of the site points as opposed to a site defined by a ligand. If there are no ligands or sites present in the workspace and you only have a receptor present, you can use the centroid of selected residues option to define the enclosing grid box. To select the residues, click Specify Residue, then using the picking controls, simply pick the residues that best define the active site. As you pick residues, the grid centers on the centroid of the selected residues. The third option for defining the enclosing grid box is based on the Cartesian coordinates that you specify here. In this example, we'll just define the site based on the centroid of the workspace ligand, so let's make sure that we put the ligand back in the workspace and that it's selected in the receptor tab. The Constraints tab of the Receptor Grid Generation panel is used to define docking constraints for the receptor grids to be generated. These constraints are receptor ligand interactions that you believe to be important in the binding mode based on structural or biochemical data. Setting constraints enables Glide to screen out ligands, conformations or poses that do not meet these criteria early on in their evaluation for docking suitability. There are four subtabs covering six types of docking constraints, so let's go through them in detail.
A positional constraint is a requirement that one or more ligand atoms occupy a spherical volume that is centered at a particular position. Now the specific kind of atom will be defined later on during the docking stage using SMART's patterns. But here, during grid generation is where we define the region in the active site. So for example, suppose we wanted to screen for more ligands that place an aromatic group in this S4 pocket enclosed by these three aromatic residues, just like where the imidazole is positioned. To do that, we simply choose New from the Positional NOE Constraint tab, then pick the atom to define the position. Here, we'll pick the carbon atom that is between the two nitrogens in the imidazole ring. We'll then rename the constraint to say S4 underscore AROM. So we know that later on during the docking stage, we'll have this constraint as an option for finding new ligands that place an aromatic group here in the S4 pocket. Now we'll make sure the constraint type is set for position. And then in this case, we'll enlarge the region by making the sphere radius two angstroms. Then we'll click OK. So there we have a positional constraint that, when optionally applied during docking, should help us find ligands that place an aromatic group in this region. NOE constraints are similar to positional constraints, but require that the ligand atoms lie in a given distance range from the constraint center, i.e. in the shell between two spheres. The constraint is similar to utilizing interproton distance constraints estimated from nuclear overhauser effect spectra, or NOE spectra. For example, let's suppose we know that ligands are constrained to a certain distance range. For example, that the ligand or fragment is somewhere between one to three and a half angstroms from this valine. So to set this up, simply click new from the positional NOE tab, pick on the atom to define the NOE constraint, rename if you wish, and then choose NOE as the constraint type. And then specify the radius minimum and radius maximum distances to define the range. So in this case, the constraint defines a range between the inner and outer shells for a specific SMART pattern on the ligand, which will be defined later on during the docking stage, to occupy this position. In this exercise, however, we will only use the positional constraint, so let's delete the NOE constraint. An H-bond constraint is a requirement that a particular receptor ligand hydrogen bond be formed. In this example, let's first show hydrogen bond interactions. Now here, we'll define an H-bond constraint for the carboxylate on the aspartate, which is interacting with the amidine of the ligand. By doing so, we'll be setting up an option to find new ligands during a screen that similarly interact with the aspartate via hydrogen bonds. So let's set up the constraint by ensuring that pick atoms is selected in the H-bond metal constraint tab, and then we'll click on the carboxyl oxygen that is hydrogen bonded to the amidine of the ligand, like so. Now the padlock indicates we've defined the constraints to both oxygens on the carboxylate despite only picking one oxygen. That's because Glide includes symmetry related atoms as part of the constraint. This can be turned on or off with the use symmetry checkbox. Now if you need to set up an H-bond constraint from a donor group such as this serine, simply pick the hydrogen atom. In this example, we'll just keep the H-bond to the aspartate and delete the serine hydrogen bond constraint. There are two types of metal constraints. There's the metal ligand interaction constraint, and then there's the metal coordination constraint. The metal ligand interaction constraint, also just known as a metal constraint, is a requirement that a particular metal ligand interaction is present when the ligand is docked. The ligand atom must lie in a sphere around a specified receptor metal atom, which means that the constraint on the ligand atom has no directionality. Setting up a metal ligand interaction constraint is similar to an H-bond constraint, but where the receptor atom is a metal ion. Simply ensure pick is checked on, then select the metal on the workspace. Similar to the metal constraint feature is the metal coordination constraint, which also requires a ligand atom to lie within a specified distance for optimal binding with the metal. But unlike the metal constraint, the metal coordination constraint incorporates directionality by identifying possible coordination sites on the metal and then allows you to use any or none of the sites found. So in this particular example, if we ensure pick metal atom is checked on and then pick the metal in the binding site, we'll first see the red sphere representing the region that the metal binding group must be located in. And then in the table, we can see the coordination geometry listed as tetrahedral. In this other example, we can see that the receptor metal creates two sites defining octahedral coordination geometries. 
Now since in this case ligands can only approach from one direction, we can turn off one of the sights by unchecking the box in the Use column. If you want finer control over the orientation of the sight from the initial location, you can select Rotate and then rotate the orientation of the coordination site around the metal with the usual actions for workspace rotation. You can also edit the XYZ coordinates in the table, as well as edit the maximum distance or rename the metal coordination constraint. Ok, back to our tutorial example. The hydrophobic constraint is a requirement that a user-defined number of hydrophobic heavy atoms in the ligand occupy a hydrophobic region in the active site. These hydrophobic regions are first identified by pressing the Locate Hydrophobic Cells button, which runs a short job to generate a hydrophobic map of the receptor site. Once the job finishes, a collection of translucent grey cubes will represent the hydrophobic regions around the active site. You can adjust the threshold phobic potential with the slider, which corresponds to the ISO value contour at which the hydrophobic map is displayed. So here, a less negative threshold enlarges the hydrophobic region, and a more negative threshold diminishes the hydrophobic region. Now once the hydrophobic map has been generated, you can click on the cells to make the selection, or expand the selection by clicking the Grow button. The cells in red now represent the hydrophobic constraint, which we can optionally use later on during the docking stage, where you'll be able to specify how many hydrophobic heavy atoms in the ligand must occupy the selected hydrophobic region. In this exercise, we won't use this hydrophobic constraint, as we have instead opted to use a positional constraint for this particular region to find aromatic groups. So here, we'll just delete it. The hydroxyl groups in residues such as serine, threonine and tyrosine, and the thiol group in cysteine, can adopt different orientations with different ligands. So here, in the Rotatable Groups tab, we have the option to allow such groups to adopt different orientations when ligands are docked, to produce the most favourable interaction. Simply turn on the checkbox to allow rotation of receptor hydroxyl and thiol groups, to see a list of available rotatable groups within the grid box. Here, you can either check the box to use that particular rotatable group, or simply ensure Pick Groups is turned on, and then pick the hydrogen atom of the hydroxyl or thiol in the workspace. Now if you just so happen to be using a receptor from a previously prepared grid file with flexible groups already, you can select to use existing definitions. Now keep in mind that when docking ligands with flexible groups, the time taken is longer than for non-flexible docking calculations. An SP docking job can take twice as long, while an XP docking job can take four times as long. Also note that once you have set up a grid with flexible groups, the flexibility will be used in the docking and cannot be turned off. Also, at the time of making this video, the current release cannot create constraints to flexible groups. Now in this example, I am very happy with the receptor structure after going through the protein preparation process with the protein preparation wizard, and also we have good confidence in the orientations of the rotatable groups, particularly this serine hydroxyl, in which case we are not going to apply this option. In the excluded volumes tab, we have the option to set up excluded volumes, which will prevent docked ligands from occupying certain regions of space. For example, if you have a pocket near the active site where ligands are known not to bind, you might want to stop ligands from occupying that pocket. Or, a case might be where parts of the protein are missing, and you want to prevent ligands from occupying that region. Now in this example, we don't have any genuine reason to set up an excluded volume, however, we'll create one in any case, just as a control. So here, we'll click New, ensure Pick is selected, and then we'll pick the carboxyl oxygen that is interacting with the amidine of the ligand. We'll leave the default name and radius, and click OK. Now here, we can see a red sphere representing the excluded volume. So, if we decide to apply this option later on in docking, it should prevent ligands from binding into this region of the active site, despite the fact that this region is actually a very favourable region because of the aspartate interaction. OK. Now that the co-crystallized ligand has been selected so it can be excluded from the grid generation, the active site defined, and the constraints set up, in this example, just one positional constraint, one hydrogen bond constraint, and an excluded volume to optionally use later on for docking, we can now start the grid generation job. We'll rename the job to factor 10a underscore grid, and then we'll click run. We can monitor the job by opening the monitor panel, and this job should only take a couple of minutes. When the calculation finishes, the directory in which you ran the grid job will contain a log summary file, and an output summary file, and the all important archive or .zip grid file.
It is this single zip file that contains all of the necessary grid files to be used later on in the actual ligand docking stage.